I started to look at it a little bit differently. I'd started to, you know, um, is this person committed? You know, are they flaky? Are they full time? And, you know, that whole full time thing is, is tough because um, I still have met guys that do it part time that I think are, you know, know what they're doing. But if I had a choice, I'd rather see someone with fully invested, you know, full time skin in the game, not just, you know, um, it's not a side hustle. So that would be important for me. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig. With me, as always, is John Cohen. How's it going, bud? Uh, we're good. We are uh, chugging along, right? 2021 is underway. I think people are back at it. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, we are chugging along. Nice. How's the... Uh, we, we talked about it last time we recorded, not the previous episode, the last batch, the... Uh, the, the health and weight thing. How's that? How's that progressing? We, we are, we are crushing on track. Um, Yeah. Yeah. No, we are, we are doing phenomenal. I, you know, I think, uh, in 2021, I think I'm down like six pounds or six and a half pounds already. God damn. Uh, just like total lifestyle changings. Right. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's not, you know, I'm not, you know, no crazy diet or anything like that. I'm just making the right choices. Um, but you know, the initial 10 is easy to lose. It's then keeping it off and maintaining that and continuing on that goal. But, uh, I think the big thing is just, you know, getting, you know, the more strict, you know, 45 minutes minimum of cardio when I do it, you know, I try and get two cardios in a day, uh, you know, after this month, you know, I'll start incorporating a, a you know, more lifting and, and, uh, and that stuff. But, you know, so far it's been, uh, it's been really good. I'm actually looking forward to, you know, that date and time when we have that podcast where we get to mm -hmm. rip on my results, but, uh, we'll have to do a live weigh in. Yeah, we'll do. We'll, we'll have to get you scale. a portable webcam or we'll, we'll record it separately and we'll do it as a special episode. So, so the PG version with clothes on, I might have to add a couple pounds in there, but, uh, you know, so Light, far stuff, come on. <laughs> we are, uh, no, we are, we are actually off to a, uh, a good start. I'm, I'm mm. really excited. Uh, we actually made it more of a competition. So my dad is actually on board now. Oh, nice. Uh, we have a goal who could lose the most weight and then keep it off. So it's going to be, uh, hopefully it spills out and, and we can continue this. And, uh, and you know, I don't want to be off the deep end in a week. Right. And you're sitting there with like chocolate coming off my face and shit, but, uh, now nah, we're, uh, we're good. We're, we'll feel good. Awesome. What's the, what's the goal? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to lose 40 pounds this year. And where, how far have you gotten? So I'm about six and a half pounds in right now. Uh, but the, the goal when I set out was 10 pounds a quarter. Um, obviously, you know, I think I can do it quicker, but I'm trying to, you know, I want it to be achievable and I don't want to, you know, eat one leaf a day, right? I want to do it while still maintaining a healthy diet, uh, you know, eating when you're supposed to, smaller meals and stuff like that. So um, the goal is to get back into, you know, the presentable good shape, not, you know, listen, I'm not going to be, you know, a, six pack and ripped, but, uh, you know, just so you, you're better, you're healthier. I have a two-year-old daughter. So, you know, I want to be able to play with her and, you know, all that good stuff. So it's, it's 40 pounds by the end of the year, uh, in 10, in 10 pound increments over the quarters, you know, each quarter. Nice. Good. Good for you. I, I, I picked up COVID 10. So, uh, let me know what you're doing. Cause I gotta, I gotta follow. <laughs> you and me both, man. When it, when we first started, I was working out every day, right. Cause I was home and there wasn't a lot going on and I lost weight. And then like the wheels just came off the bus and, and it was just eating every day. And it's like, yeah, you know what? And I said it the other day, listen, it's, I'm not one of those like nasty dieters. It's like always yelling at people. But last night I was in bed. I was like, yo, it is so much fucking better being fat than it is trying to be skinny. <laughs> 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 but yeah. uh, well, listen, I'm going to be, right? I'm going to be more impressed by the second 10 pounds. Cause I know you and your tricks, you probably ate a bunch of food right before the initial weigh in. <laughs> Gave yourself an extra couple of pounds of wiggle room. So yeah. when you no, get to so, 10, so, we'll see how 11 to 20 goes. Yeah, we, we actually technically, you know, I'm not one of those New Year's people. So we actually started this at the end, right around Christmas time. And even my mother-in-law and everyone's like, you're crazy. What are you doing? It's the holidays. You're supposed to pack it on. And I'm like, listen, I'm not, I'm not counting calories, but 
you know, I don't, I don't need four pieces of cake, right? You know, one piece of cake is fine. So, but no, yes, no, I was at an all time fat. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's, I, like I said, the, the first 10, I'm not worried about that's, that's the easy part, right? That's two weeks. Uh, but then maintaining that, maintaining that lifestyle and then continuing that push to 40, uh, it's going to be fun. If I do it, I'll be fucking happy as a pig and shit. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. I actually had uh, uh, watched uh, Austin Linney. He's, do- he's on his second round of doing 75 hard and Mike Taravella just started it. So I actually decided to start it yesterday. So I'm on day two of trying to do it. So we'll see how that goes. I saw your, uh, I saw your post and it was, you know, I read, uh, I was actually have this podcast and uh, that is what my plan is to kickstart the back 20. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like I got to get, I got to get into it. And then it's something that I have on my, you know, to-do list this year to see if I can do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, the excuse I'm going to make, and it's a bona fide excuse is it's fucking cold out. So I don't want to do it right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's why I'm doing it now. Cause it's a moderate temperature down in Florida. It's only like 50 degrees outside. I don't want to be doing it when it's 90. I mean, I'll probably lose a ton more weight and it'll be easier to drink a gallon of water a day. Cause I'll be sweating it out, but God, I don't want to be outside when it's 90 yes. degrees at 6 a.m. So you I don't look like you have any weight to lose, Chris. Yeah, no. <laughs> You'd be shocked. <laughs> I, uh, I, I took the 75 hard and I said, okay, let's do everything except for that one outdoor workout, right? Let's see if we can get, uh, you know, so let's see if we can, cute. so I can, I can ease into it instead of just going cold turkey, but being that as it may, uh, we will see how it shakes out. Yeah, for sure. So if you guys are interested or care at all about me and John's health and wellness, stick around, be sure to keep listening because either we're both going to fail or we're both going to do it. So we'll see what happens. There you go. Um, but awesome. Let's jump into today's episode. Got a great guest on today. You already heard a little sneak peek of, um, but excited to have him on and hear his story. So Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here guys. Yeah, for sure. So kick us off, uh, tell everybody a little bit about you, you know, your journey, uh, your experience and what you do. Yeah. So, um, let's see early twenties. I didn't do much of anything. I travel around the world and, and, uh, was was a backpacker and a, a seeker of of uh, what what life is all about. And that was a, an amazing journey. Um, got got a little bit more serious about figuring out what I want to do in my mid to later twenties. Uh, grew up in a real estate family for a bit of background. My dad was a, a builder developer. My brother is a builder developer, so it's in our family. Um, I was the black sheep. I went out west and taught high school on a Navajo reservation. It was sort of the, the first or one of a few um, early, early um, entries into just, you know, having a career. Did that for a whole year and a half, thought I was going to, you know, save the world. And I guess I did in a whole year and a half, did my work. Um, and then just realized that I honestly didn't like teaching. Um, Love the connection with the kids, but said, what's next? And uh my ex-wife and I were traveling to Durango, Colorado, this really cool mountain town on the weekends. And when I quit teaching, I said, you know, now what? And um, just reverted back to what I know, which is uh, construction, real estate development. Went up there and decided this would be a great place to start a company. So did that in 98, started. Uh, we really did two things. We did high-end design, build construction. So we were vertically integrated, had architects, interior designers, as well as, of course, construction on staff. Uh, And then sister company, really, uh, that was a small developer. So subdivisions, um, single family developments, townhomes, condos, mixed use, a little bit of commercial, and really, you know, started to grow those two verticals. Had an amazing run. We doubled in size almost every year for many years. Uh, And then along the way, I started, um, you know, I I was single at the time. And uh, just not a lot of places to spend money on in Southwest Colorado, except skiing and and drinking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, So I was making a ton of money, had all this cash and started buying real estate, started buying for my own portfolio, not syndicating, you know, just my own capital, buying uh, rentals, duplexes, triplexes, um, college rentals, uh, some commercial and kind of grew, kept going and going. And, um, you know, didn't really take it that seriously as, as a business, obviously, because it was just a side hustle and a place to invest my own capital. Uh, fast forward, let's see, to 
about four or five years ago, company has really uh, grown. We're um, the largest single family developer in Southwest Colorado. We're building in Telluride, uh, Durango, Pagosa Springs, Mancus, kind of that whole two hour radius, if you know the area in Southwest Colorado. Um, have a great team running uh, that company. And I learned about multifamily. I think I went to a conference and um, anyway, I said, you know, this sounds so much better than having all this scattered site, random, sing, you know, single family duplexes, triplexes, and pivoted into multifamily. While, while my you know, main company was being run by a great team, we actually moved back to Chicago, uh, where, I'm, where I am now, about uh, three years ago. The team's running that company. I'm pivoting. Uh, starting to divest of all my other assets and pivoting into multifamily. So that's really how the multifamily side started uh, for the last three years, have been uh, scaling that business. And last year sold the Colorado company. So I had a successful exit um, and moved on from that. And uh, yeah, so that's the 10,000 foot story of, of how we got here today. Awesome. Now, were you guys just like, fee developers and like basically doing the projects for people that were sourcing these deals or were you also sourcing deals, finding the capital, putting together the whole projects? In, in, in Colorado, you mean? Yeah. So, so uh, we were, so the, the really, there was two verticals. The primary business, really the engine of all the, all the profits we made over the years was the custom home building business. So that's building on people's land. They buy a lot, they hire my firm, we design and build, you know, you know, anything from a million dollar to multi-million dollar custom home. Uh, and then the other side of it was where we would actually take down land and with my own capital develop. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we would actually even partner with uh, developers where we were on both sides of the table, the developer and the builder. And that that was a pretty um, typical, typical scenario. So that was a... A great business did um, did some really nice. They're all smaller. It's a small market. It's it's not like being a you know developer in Chicago, but great projects uh, in a in a great you know growing market in a beautiful area. So uh, uh, a great great run there for a little over twenty years. That's awesome. And what what eventually happened that you know you decided to sell and move on to something else? You know. Talk me through. In terms of the, in terms of that business, I would say one thing that I hated about that business it was so um, geographically dependent on me being there. Right, even though in the last uh, couple of years, last three years, I was living in Chicago and I had a great team running it. You still feel like you have to you have to travel there frequent enough. You've got to be on the phone with your team every day. And it worked. I mean, we actually grew tremendously through the last uh, three years and, and sold the company with, with probably our, our, our most profitable year. So the timing was great, but still I felt like I was too tied down to a place. Um, and I hated that. I'm a, you know, I wanted to have more freedom to live anywhere I wanted to live. Uh, I started a family late in life. So I've got almost a six year old right now. And I didn't want to be traveling constantly away from my kid. I wanted to have a business that, you know, if I wanted to come join you in Florida, Chris, I could, uh, or wherever. And, and, and then also a more scalable business. I think over 20 years, we grew that business to probably as, as big as it was going to get. And I was, you know, super, uh, um, happy for that and, and grateful for my team that we were able to do that. But I think we reached a ceiling. And it was a good time to exit. Um, you know, in retrospect, I was thinking, God, I, you know, I, um, my timing couldn't have been more perfect because I sold, you know, a couple, two, three months before COVID hit. And uh, I thought, you know, oh my God, that guy's going to struggle. But, you know, as, as you, as you won't be surprised to hear the, um, the flight from the cities to the mountain towns and people living anywhere and being able to work from anywhere just kept fueling that growth and, and my, the company that I started is doing very well. Um, so, so maybe I should have held on for a little bit longer because they, they seem like they just keep breaking that ceiling, which is really cool. Cool to watch as uh, something I started, but I don't have the benefit of the, of the profitability from that company anymore. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And what, 
what are you focused on now that you fully transitioned out of that into, you know, full-time real estate investor? So for the last three years, it's been, you know, the hundred plus apartments, you know, I started out, uh, I mean, I started out as an LP, you know, probably five years ago, investing in, in some of the larger syndicators deals and then transitioned into um, the co-GP where uh, I help guys with a few different things. I help, you know, raise some equity, uh, then a transition into me jumping on board with some of the syndicators as a KP and helping with uh, the loan guarantor, bringing my net worth liquidity and experience of 20 years in real estate. And then, you know, for uh, the last, you know, couple of years, <clears throat> it's really been us as either a co-GP uh, or a lead sponsor taking down a hundred plus unit deals, similar, you know, to what, what you guys do. Uh, obviously a few years behind you in, in the uh, trajectory, but that's what we do. Gotcha. And what is it about, you know, the, the business or the investing and stuff that, you know, was appealing in that, you know, having, you know, the background in developing single family homes or whatever, you know, why didn't you go that route? You know, you've got 20 years experience developing. Why didn't you go that route in multifamily versus, you know, some of the existing stuff and, you know, bringing equity to the table or being co-GP or lead sponsor, whatever it is. Yeah. Good question. Um, you know, there's a couple of things. I, I think one, it goes back to one of my previous statements that I think this business is more scalable and it's not as geographically dependent. Of course, it'd be great to be hunting deals in Florida and be right there, but you don't have to be. You know, you you can certainly buy from uh, from a distance. So I like I like that part of it. I also like the tax advantages and 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 continuing to build my wealth without you know constantly you know the construction and development businesses could be very lucrative and it was for me, but it's like you're hunting every deal every year. So that cycle of find a deal, build a deal, sell a deal. It's about a 12 to 18 month cycle. Mm-hmm. And it's just a tremendous amount of work. I like the fact that with multifamily, you got the hunt, you got the deal, you take it down, you do a, a decent amount of the work, and obviously there's still uh, plenty of work, especially if you're doing a CapEx and a turnaround on a project. But at some point you've got an asset that's performing, you've got a property manager that's doing their job and you become an asset manager and it's, you got an investment, you did a lot of work up front, you're doing a decent amount of work, but it lasts you five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And um, that, and then the tax advantage, of course, that that uh, is much more advantageous than turning ordinary income and short-term capital gains constantly. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you think when you, when you stepped out of the, the single family world or the development side in Colorado and came here, how have you seen the skill set and or what benefit managing that for 20 years than taking that three year or so time where you might be traveling back and forth? How has that helped your properties or your asset management or your team building on your properties? Cause I'm assuming that, you know, with all the projects going on and the custom builds are not down the fairway a lot of the times and you're dealing with people that, you know, want to change a piece of glass or they want a better view. How have you been able to use those things or what tips can you give anybody to that, that has helped you not only raise money and do deals, but to execute on those deals for the last, you know, three years or so, five years. Sure. That's a good question. I, uh, I should think about that more, but, um, off the top of my head, you know, in terms of the, the front end of it, in terms of, um, you know, equity, you know, I, I've got a long list of uh, high net worth clients, friends from over the years of doing business. Uh, in terms of due diligence, I would say, you know, through the development world, it's a similar concept, right? You have an opportunity. You have to assess the, the viability, the zoning, marketability, um, what's the right product mix. So, you, you tend to look through things with the same uh, lens in multifamily, right? So, you know, you're, you're doing your due diligence, you're evaluating, should I, should I buy in Atlanta or should I buy in Columbus? Should I buy in, in Jacksonville? Where should I buy and why? And it's a similar concept to development. You know, am I going to do an infill project or am I going to do, you know, townhome, single family, where's the market? So it's the same, you know, different metrics, but same set of due diligence, um, you know, mindset that, that, that we uh, would, would use in, in the development world. 
Um, construction has been sort of a, uh, how shall I put it, um, a benefit and, uh, and uh, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll leave it as a benefit, but I'll give you an example. We were under contract for a great student housing deal um, this summer in the middle of COVID. And, you know, most guys I think would have done a pretty cursory due diligence and inspection of the property. I drove down there with my construction background. I mean, I was probably looking in places that most guys wouldn't look, but what I found ultimately led to us terminating the deal. I found mechanicals that were, you know, designed wrong, that were leaking, creating all kinds of mold. I found grading and drainage issues. Um, I mean, just all kinds of things. It was a six-year-old asset that looked and lived like a 25-year-old asset. I mean, it was amazing. So um, I guess for better or for worse, I kill some of my own deals by looking in places that some guys would probably be okay with. Um, so the construction side obviously helps. Uh, managing property managers and contractors on the CapEx side, I think helps. Um, but in the same sense that, I, that it helps, uh, it's funny, I've gotten feedback from property managers that, that sort of in a nice way are saying, you know, Alex, you, you, you ask uh, certain questions or, or wanna know about certain things that typical owners don't. And I think it's their, a nice way of them saying you're a pain in the ass, but it, I can't, it's like, I can't stop. You know what I mean? You know, I want to know that if my, if my property managers um, are doing something that lien releases are, are signed off and that, you know, the insurance waivers are there and that we're additional insurance and all these things that I've just been programmed into from the construction world. And uh, anyway, so I, again, it's amazing because, as you know, someone that we do a ton of deals with and who's been a partner on my deals from day one, deal one, you know, he worked for a major mechanical engineering firm in New York City. So the first deal I did, you know, I'm a bull in a China closet, right? I bought a deal and I'm just fucking, you know, I figure it out. You know, I might get a couple black eyes and stuff, but I typically get it to the finish line. And we were out there and he said, you know, you got to get a lean waiver. I'm 23, 24 at the time. Like the fuck is a lean waiver like? And he's just... But like little things like that, when you try and implement it, you know, there are groups out there in management companies and large management companies that have no idea what that stuff is. And they just say, oh, that, that's not normal for this market. And, you know, what you don't know, you don't know. But when you come from that background and you just, you know, you're always protecting the backside and protecting yourself, you know, they look at you something like you said, the nice way of, of playing, you're, you know, you're a pain in my ass. But, yeah. but those are the things that, you know, that's where you can you know, limit mistakes and limit your downside. And when, you know, a guy does work and then says he didn't do it. So those are the little things that, you know, anyone can pick up just from a conversation. You know, you might not have any idea what it is, but the end of this podcast, or when you listen to this, Google it, and you're going to implement that day in and day out. So little things like that are things that, you know, you might not have any idea what it is, but once you do, you look at you're like, thank God it never came back to bite me in the, bite me in the ass. But uh, it's important. And I think that background is, is huge because you're right. You're looking at a grading issue that you say, this is a major problem in the future. Most people overlook that because they have no idea what that can really relate or, or correlate to in terms of dollars over two, four, five, ten 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's helped. I think, I think the other thing is maybe it's this uh, trust, but verify philosophy attitude. Um, you know, I, I think as you see some professionals that come into the multifamily space and they were wherever they came from, uh, technology, some sort of executive, whatever. And they're probably used to an ecosystem where it's very professional and people generally do what they say they're going to do. Um, construction development, you don't. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'll be there Tuesday. All right. Uh, and I'm done with my work. Really? Well, let alone put on the white glove and make sure you're done with your work and it's to my standards. And, you know, so it's just, it's just this way of looking at it. And some people I think might be put off because you come off as a skeptic or you're, you're, you're distrust, you know, you're not, you, you don't trust them, but it really is, I think the most prudent way to operate any business is you trust, but you got to verify. No, oh, hundred percent. I could relate to that. So I think one of the things that is interesting to me is because as I've been going through this process with the 16 unit I just bought, I've spent more time than ever inspecting a lot of the physical aspects of the property. And my dad is involved in the deal and he has 
a good deal of construction knowledge. He was an electrical engineer. You know, he's built some stuff. He, you know, his own real estate knows way more than I do. And honestly, he's just super interested in, you know, as a type of person to dive deep into things. So it's helping him educate me. And there's so many little things that I've now seen where he's like, oh, they should have done this, or we would have done this differently, or, you know, I would like to do this. And then I hear you talk about that six-year-old complex doing certain things wrong. And I guess the thought that I had been having was like, wow, if you know how you want something to be built, why wouldn't you just build something, refinance and hold it where you get the same long-term benefits of buying existing multifamily? I guess that's where um, it's interesting that you went that direction. It's interesting to me that you haven't gone the route of building something to hold long-term so that you can bring all your skill set over to make sure things are being done right. Because like even a really good example, the complex I live in personally is only 10 years old. And I was talking to a guy that does some handiwork and maintenance stuff. And I was looking at the water heater and the HVAC in my complex versus this one. And in the one I live in, they have it stacked. And he said, oh, I hate that because water drips down onto the mechanicals and it destroys both. And he said, you, ne- you don't want to do that. And he said, I don't know why people build it that way. And it just feels like those are things that as someone with knowledge, you could actually avoid and do proper and like have an asset that you're like, Hey, I know this is going to be good. I'm not going to have those problems. Yeah. Like, is there like other reasons beside that? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, it's a natural fit that I would. And I, I don't think it's, it's, if it's when, uh, you know, initially, um, I think one of the things that caused me some, some pause, especially lately is, you know, there's more risks when you're, when you have construction development, you have so many more unknowns, right. And, and there's gotta be a a risk reward element there. So, you know, your, your returns have to be higher because you're taking on construction risk. There might be entitlement development risk. And then of course there's lease up risk. Um, and then if you look at where we are in the cycle and you've got a softness in the economy, you know, I, I have to ask myself that question. Do I want to be in an A-class asset right now? Mm-hmm. And in some, some, you know, MSAs, maybe the answer is yes. And in some, no, I think I'd rather hedge my bet and be in a C and B asset class and not take on that development construction lease up risk right now. But there will, there will come a time and there'll be certain markets where I say the risk is is justifiable and i would want to do it and and leverage my experience as well Mm -hmm. gotcha it's just it's a heavier lift i mean but you're absolutely right so if you want a you know a a legacy asset that you hold on to for a long time um that's the way to get into it get into it for a good basis uh mitigating that risk and then hold on to it for you know a long time and then keep, keep refining out. I mean, that's, that is the, that is one of my goals is to do that and um, continue to refi out every five years, pull that equity out tax-free and, and keep that ball going. Mm -hmm. Do you, I was going to say, do you think there is, I know it's very market specific, so it's a very general question, but it's a shitty question. But at the end of the day, is there a way to build cost effectively a really good B product. Cause I think the things that you identified in risk, listen, everyone wants that class A building, you know, on Maine and Maine and Manhattan, but you know, it's going to command a major price, which is going to inherently make it more risky. How can you, or what type of product from the building perspective do you think could be a really good long-term, you know, B, B product? Is it like a townhouse layout? Like what do you think you could build that would stand the time, but is a really good product. If someone wanted to take on builders risk today, what does that product look like in your eyes? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's something I've, I've looked at a product that was, that is four or five years old in Michigan townhome product. Um, I looked at an opportunity in Alabama that was, it would have ended up at a, at a B plus type of product and, and really what you end up or, or the conclusion I came to is so you build something that's simple. It's just good construction that, you know, it's not high maintenance, but it's not highly amenitized. So therefore it drops your rent to a level that's more attainable to, you know, professionals and it meets that B plus um, asset class, but you're not, you're not building anything fancy. You're not building anything that's highly amenitized. 
uh, your operating costs are lower. But again, you got a great, you know, great new product that that's a B plus. So you know, it's it's what you guys buy, um, just just new uh, yeah. and a si- simple design, simple build. Yep, that that's something that's been intriguing to me is if you could figure out that puzzle in today's world where affordable housing doesn't exist. If you can figure out that piece where you can build a nice, clean product, you know, you're not going four, five, six, seven stories where you're going to have to get into crazy different types of construction and stick and concrete, you know, that's where your price starts going up. But if you can build a nice, affordable, clean deal and, and, you know, you look for things here and there to say, okay, would this location work? And it's something that's been intriguing to me, especially where we are in the market. You know, we, we believe, listen, there's a ton of people out there buying deals at crazy prices, but I say, you know, if you could take on that risk today by going through that entitlement process and that zoning, if you can do that today and you can let time ride itself out by the time you're ready to put a shovel in the ground, you can ride out whatever this imper- you know, whatever this pro- this period looks like. So it's something that's attractive, but at the same time, they're coming, you know, it, f- trying to find it is tough. So, it, but it's an interesting way to look at, you know, a, you know can you develop that product that, that would be really attractive to, you know, a large quantity of people while still maintaining, you know, that affordability. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. As I say, it's, it's probably not, not, not if, but when for me, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's this coming year. I don't know. I'm, I'm not out actively looking for it. I'm still hunting, you know, the typical C and B, um, you know, value add asset classes that you guys are, are hunting for. Um, but because of my background, people keep hitting me up for, hey, what do you, th-? I mean, I was just on a call this morning for an opportunity that was uh, an existing asset that was in Colorado at a ski resort. So, you know, right in my wheelhouse that had a development piece to it that was, had some vacant land. So I found myself, you know, starting to think about it, go down that road. But in the same, same breath as I get sort of excited about it, leveraging my experience, it is a heavier lift. <clears throat> and, you know, if I've got that versus something that's teed up, that's off market that I can buy and start cash flowing right away, you know, I'll, I'll probably keep going back to the, the immediate cash flow. Gotcha. And, and, the, and the other part of it, you know, is what type of investor base do you have, right? So if your investors are looking for immediate cash flow and low risk, you know, development deals are going to be a hard sell. So, you, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, that, that, that's part of the equation. Of course. 100%. It's just, it's just funny because I'm sitting here as I'm doing this deal and, you know, I'm trying to buy deals to refi and hold them for the long term, right? That's just what I want to do. I want to pull money out. I think too many people are in and out of deals too quickly. Um, and I think it's, it comes back to like, you hear the saying of like not timing the market, time in the market, which is what most people relay about, you know, the, the financial markets, you know, the stock market and stuff. Um, but I think it kind of comes over to the commercial side as well. And I'm sitting here, I'm saying, God damn, why don't I just find a piece of land and build it? Because if you can do it, it's really easy. You know, if you hit the numbers, it's really easy to refi out. And then you really got something you don't have to worry about from a maintenance standpoint, which is something I don't want to deal with. Um, so maybe naively, I'm, you know, my second deal shouldn't be a development deal, but it's just like, I sit here and I'm like, God, that would be so much better, but I understand your point completely. Um, one thing I do want to ask you, cause I think it could be helpful for a lot of people. Uh, when you started looking as like an LP and then as you started looking as like a co-GP and working with partners and things like that, what would you look for in sponsors or operators or people you were going to partner with that were going to be running the deal or play a part in the deal uh, on these existing multifamily deals? What are some things that you would look for either positively or negatively um, to help you pick and choose? Because obviously with these deals, it's never just about the real estate. It's also about the person running the deal as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I always look at the person first, you know, bet on the jockey. You know, I look at um, through different channels uh, that the Tiger 21 group I mentioned before, we get a lot of deal flow. I always look at the person behind it and I bet on the jockey. Um, you know, then you look at the asset class and other, other dynamics, of course. So, you know, that, that's always something that I always looked at first. So, you know, really the, 
the the lens that I look through has changed from when I was strictly an LP to say uh, a co GP KP. You know that line blurs, but initially I looked at you know um, guys who had a great reputation, guys that I connected with, guys that I trusted, right? Um, you know, so I found a, a few operators. You know, the larger guys uh, that I invested in, I was comfortable. Uh, as I started to you know go to conferences and meet guys and meet guys that would come to me and say, Hey, I got the soft market deal. I don't have the net worth liquidity. I need a little help here and there. Um, I started looking a, a little bit differently. I'd started to, you know, um, is this person committed? You know, are they flaky? Are they full time? And, you know, that whole full time thing is, is tough because um, I, I've still have met guys that do it part time that I think are, you know, know what they're doing. But if I had a choice, I'd rather see someone with fully invested, you know, full time skin in the game, not just, you know, uh, it's not a side hustle. So that would be important for me. Um, you know, and then as far as, um, you know, the deal, um, I'm always looked to de-risk any situation. Right. So how risky is it? What kind of debt is this guy trying to put on it? Um, you know, how heavy of a lift. And then, you know, one of the other really, you know, the biggest tell I think that you see in this business when people approach you to partner and do something is whether or not they've done their homework. So if guys come to me and they say, I've got an off market deal, you know, they throw me some OM that, you know, might be outdated and, you know, just, just a bunch of garbage and they haven't done their due diligence. There's no rent comps to support their, their business plan, then, you know, I can almost tell right away it's a complete waste of my time because they, they haven't proven to themselves. They almost bring you a deal and then say, you figured out, you tell me if it works. Well, if I'm going to do that, I don't need you. I want you to bring me a deal that's teed up and demonstrate to me that you've done your homework and that you know what you're doing, right? And if you got a few um, holes in the story, I can help fill them in, so to speak. But um, do the work and know what you're doing. So that's that's somewhat of uh, you know of what I look for. And, but at the end of the day, life is too short. And if you're a dick, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to do business with you. I don't want to partner with you, right? Um, I've walked away from some potentially lucrative deals that look good on paper, but. There was something about the operator or the sponsor that just didn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had anybody just bring you like a broker OM and say, let's do this deal or no? Yeah. 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 yeah guys who, you know, said, look, I'm, I'm looking at this deal. Uh, it's, you know, they're calling for best and final. I want to take a run at it. I don't have the net worth liquidity. I can raise some of the equity. I can't raise it all. You want to partner on it. That, that That's fine. I'm happy to do that. You know, uh, I still want them to make a, you know, a, a pitch to me as to why, why this asset, why this market, um, why you can, can you, you know, what do you bring to the table? And if it's a good fit, we'll, we'll take a look at the deal together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting. And I'm glad you tacked that on the end where it's, you know, I think some people look at a broker OM and just say like, okay, here it is what it is. And I think it's really important to realize that that is not what it is um, and that there's a very good shot that it's going to be very different than what you imagine. Uh, I know, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people will get caught up on a lot of times when they provide debt assumptions in the book, I don't think it's very rarely wrong, but I think oftentimes you need to, like you said earlier with the development, trust, but verify and make sure exactly, you know, what's going on. Um, I was helping somebody out. They sent me an OM for like a smaller deal they were looking to buy and there's debt assumptions. And I was just like, I honestly couldn't tell if it was a construction loan or a, an agency loan just based on some of the stuff. And I was like, you know, what type of loan is this? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I was like, what, what type of loan are you getting? He's like, well, the one in the book, I was like, that, that doesn't tell me anything. You know, you have no idea what you're getting. You don't know what the requirements are, you know, things like that. So um, I would just encourage anybody that, especially as you start, you know, the single family side, small residential, that doesn't come up ever. But as you start going into the commercial and multifamily world, just understand that when, you know, people are putting stuff on paper and in these books that 
you know, those are marketing materials designed to sell the property. And some are much more reliable than others. Like we used to laugh all the time. Um, there's a broker in Indianapolis, uh, used to be Tikajan, now it's Cushman Wakefield, and they would put together this amazing book. And we were just like, what do we even have to do? You know, it was like they just broke every like sub line item down, like not even just like R and M. It would be like, you know, like pool supplies and cleaning supplies and paint supplies and like their reasoning behind it. We're like, what do you, what do they need us for? Just go bring it to equity sources. Um, and then others, they just, you know, slap some pretty pictures on a page. So you really need to understand what you're reading and where that information is coming from. And then obviously go out and trust, but verify. So yeah. I think that's super important. hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Are there for, from someone bringing a deal to you, are they, what, what are the hard no's? Like, you know, if it checks, it, it's what, or is there any hard nose that you have from a, from a deal perspective? Um, you know, there's certain deals that I think are just too small where there's just, you know, for me to do that due diligence and trust, but verify on a, you know, on a 40 unit versus a hundred unit, that work is nearly the same. The risk profile is typically the same because if, you know, if I find the loan guarantor on agency debt and that deal goes South uh, or partner commits, you know, bad boy uh, activity, whatever, you're, you you know, you're going to get a black eye. You're not going to get agency debt again. Um, so if, if I'm, if I'm going to do the deal, I, I tend to like, you know, a little bit of the larger deals as a baseline. So I'll probably walk away and I have for most, most small deals. Um, and then there's just so many guys running around here, as I mentioned, that are, um, that really shouldn't be trying to take these deals down. Right. And they, they, they just taken on way, way too much. They just don't, they don't have the baseline of what this business takes. And for me, that's a hard no. It's like, you know, you are, um, you got a day job, you really have no, you know, financial, uh, fluency. You're, you're just in the wrong business right now. You need a lot. I mean, I say no to those guys. I could pretty much tell in five minutes by talking to someone, whether I would even consider it. So there's a lot of no's in that regard. Is there there a way you could recommend to somebody listening how to, you know, cause I think if you are in that world, like you said, if, if you're in that world, people talk certain way, they say certain things, you can get a good feel pretty quickly. I think a lot of people understand that whether it's the financial world or, you know, if we tried to talk construction, you know, very quickly, I don't know my ass from my elbow you know, we tried to talk about teaching. I wouldn't know my ass from my elbow. So I think anybody can relate no matter what they're doing. Is there anything that you think you can help or point out or stuff that people should look for as they're talking to people that maybe they wouldn't realize because, you know, they're just trying to be an LP, place some money in commercial real estate, and they don't quite have the understanding uh, or they just don't have the experience yet to really properly evaluate or know kind of instinctually. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess some of the things that um, I, I tend to see um, or, uh, younger, newer uh, syndicators that, that bring me deals or they're trying to do their own deals, you know, um, trusting the, the OM, trusting, um, you know, trusting that, you know, for example, we got a deal uh, the other day and it was like, it was an Atlanta deal and the operating costs uh, were like 2,300 bucks a unit and T12 show 2,300 bucks a unit. We're like, no way, this has got to be 35, 3,800 bucks a unit in this market minimum. Um, you know, a lot of guys, they would just look at that and take that. So if there's something going on with those T12s, it, it cannot be 2,300 bucks a unit. So operating costs, um, Good rent comps. You know, we, I see it all the time. Guys are like, this is a great deal. We could pop 200 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month. You know, here, here are the rent comps that support it. I'm like, all right, when you dig in, then on the other side of town, it's not really a comp. That, that's one of the one of the bigger ones, you know. Um, you know, what else? Um, you know, hey, crazy expectations of exit cap and, um you know, uh, crazy expectations of, of uh, the capital stack of, you know, you're not going to get that much leverage. You're not going to get, you know, five years IO. I mean, just all those, all those parts and pieces. When, when I see guys just making unreasonable expectations and assumptions, 
yeah, you you know that they haven't done the homework or they're just they're not trusting, but they're they're taking that information from a broker or a guru or their buddy, you know, who owns six single family homes that says, yeah, this should work, and that's it. I think I think a way to sum it up for people that might be helpful and like super tangible um, is like trying to find the reasoning behind certain things. Like, why are they saying the things they're saying? And I'm not saying to question every single page of an OM because that's ridiculous. And, you know, I think you'll probably get turned down and it's just going to be not worth your time. But if you look at a T12 versus their budget and you see a number go down or something like that, and you ask, hey, why is this? If they can give you a good, concise reason that's not, oh, because it's the market expenses or the broker said so, or, you know, my, my buddy in single family or my guru said this is the number. You know, if they can give you a real answer, like, oh, well, our three other properties in this area are operating at this, whether you agree with that answer or not, at least there's thought behind it. And at least I think that's something that's super powerful, right? If it's like, you know, if you think the sale cap rate is really low, hey, why, why do you think you're able to sell it for that price? Well, that's what, well, that's what we bought it for. That's not a good answer. But if it's like, well, you know, we're buying a B plus at, you know, B plus asset, an area that's growing tremendous population and the supply and demand, like if there's reasoning behind it, again, you don't have to agree with them. Maybe it's not the right deal for you, but at least as you're trying to like evaluate the person running the deal, at least you'll understand their thought process. Right. And if there is no thought process or just right. a bad thought process, whether you agree with it or not, you know, it could be one of those red flags. So I think trying to poke holes in people's deals. And again, you know, two, three, five, seven, not the end of the world. You start asking 20, 30, 50 super specific questions. People are going to get tired and probably hang up on you or not give you the time of day going forward. Um, but if you're just, you know, asking reasonable questions, especially if you're investing for the first time, you know, I think someone will answer and the reasoning behind it will be very telling as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, so what are you, what are you looking at going forward? Like what's the, what's the plan for, for you, what do you see, you know, business-wise, market-wise, investment-wise? Um, so we're, you know, we're bullish. Um, you know, I think that there's opportunities out there. Um, you know, so we're, we're looking, we're hoping to do uh, an, at least an acquisition a quarter. And, um, you know, we're close to about $100 million under management right now and, and hoping to, you know, double that uh, this coming quarter. We're really evaluating... Um, you know, honing in on, on markets and also our equity sources. Um, we, we've got some good traction with family offices and, um, you know, continuing to grow our, our investor base. And then also, you know, we still like to partner with other guys. So putting the word out if, if, if guys need help and uh, continuing to grow sort of that, that piece of the, of the business. Um, but just continue on and, and grow. Um, and, and hopefully pick up four more assets this, this coming year. Mm-hmm. How do you think, and just before we wrap up just really quickly, because I was having this conversation with somebody on uh, Clubhouse of all things, which is a new app, which everyone should get yeah. on, by the way. I think it's really cool. Um, talking about retail investors versus like institutional uh, equity sources, yeah, like same. family offices, private equity, et cetera. Um, how do you feel about that? Like, wh- what are your thoughts on, you know, who's, you know, what do you like better, which, you know, whatever, wherever you want yeah. to. Good, good question. Cause I've been thinking and talking about that a lot with, uh, with, with, with our team, we've got a small team, a couple of us, um, you know, the, the allure of having a single check writer and going to institutional equity sounds great, but you know, as we've had a lot of those conversations, it's, uh, it's an expensive partner and, and a partner that, that makes you control, uh, or, or wants to control a lot of what you do. So it's, it's a challenge in my mind, and this is actually what we're really focused on and looking for is more of an entrepreneurial, smaller uh, family office. So while you know that is technically institutional, it's more of a, you know I feel like we could be a good arm uh, of a of a family office where the economics are reasonable. It's not maybe it's not as inexpensive as true LP equity, but maybe it's a hybrid between true institutional. And LP equity, and it's it's just um, it's more of a relationship. You know what I mean? You're building a relationship with a family, uh, and that that's we, we've we've made some headway this year with that, and we want to continue to grow that investor base. That for us 
feels like the right right place to be. We'll always have our core group. So if we can raise 80% of the equity with the family office type investors and then 20 or so with the 100 you know, to $200,000 check writers, feels like that's the, the best place for us to be in. Gotcha. Makes a ton of sense. Um, I think that's a great place to wrap up though. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your knowledge and insights with everybody listening. Uh, if somebody does want to learn more about you, get in touch with you, follow you, where can they do all that stuff? Uh, our website, ashlandcapitalfund.com. I'm on Facebook as well. My, my personal name, we have a business page as well, but yeah, reach out and um, we can help. We'd love to. And uh, awesome connecting with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, definitely go check him out. Go follow him. Go check out his website. Um, You should definitely do so. He's a wealth of information, knowledge, and experience. Uh, But thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you're not already subscribed, it would mean the world to John and I if you would do so. And if you are, please send it to somebody that would get a tremendous amount of value from this episode. Alex, once again, thank you so much for coming on. This is awesome. Yeah, thanks, guys. Be well. 